Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Bible study here at St. Columbanus Church. Uh, hopefully you know my name is Father Matt O'Donnell. I'm blessed to serve as the pastor here at St. Columbanus, and with me is Kimberly Johnson. Um, so we're, we're excited to be with you today to have this opportunity to continue to break open God's Word, uh, this opportunity to share and to learn with each other. I know that as you're uh, tuning in live right now, there's probably a few of you who might be just a little bit disappointed that Dr. Mark Nemo uh, isn't with us today, but he is on vacation this week. Uh, I think we could all agree he definitely deserves to be on vacation. And so uh, in his absence, you hopefully will find yourself blessed to have Kim and I. You know, over these last weeks, we've been uh, focusing our attention together in our Bible study on Acts of the Apostles. We've been really thinking together about what it means for us to be living as missionary disciples, recognizing this call that God places in our lives as the one sent into the world to share this good news of Jesus. I think even more recently, uh, especially as we announced the beginning of Renew My Church for our parish and our grouping of St. Uh, Clotilde, St. Columbanus, and St. Dorothy, we've been thinking about radical hospitality and how that's uh, linked to this call to be living as missionary disciples. So today, we find ourselves in the 10th chapter of Acts of the Apostles. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who were here last week, you finished up chapter 9 with Mark and Kim. Mm -hmm. um, even though you might not be able to see here, Kim is always with us, making sure the technology is working and helping to encourage Mark and I during the Bible study. But today, we want to jump into Acts chapter 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's really three parts that we're going to look at, okay. three sort of sections that are a part of of Acts chapter 10. So the first part we're going to read from verses uh, 1 through about 16, and then we'll take a little break and I'll do some schmoozing, as Dr. Nemo would say, and then we'll continue on from there. Okay. So I'm going to have Kim uh, read for us that section. Hopefully that you have your Bible open and you're ready to go. All right. This is the Virgin of Cornelius. Now in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of the cohort called the Italica, devout and God-fearing along with his whole household, who used to give alms generously to the Jewish people and pray to God constantly. One afternoon about three o'clock, he saw plainly in a vision an angel of God come in to him and say to him, Cornelius. He looked intently at him and seized with fear said, what is it, sir? He said to him, your prayers and almsgiving have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send some men to Joppa and summon one Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with another Simon, a tanner, who has a house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from his staff explained everything to them and sent them to Joppa. The next day, while they were on their way and nearing the city, Peter went up to the roof terrace to pray about noontime. He was hungry and wished to eat, and while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowering to the ground by its four corners. In it were all the earth's four-legged animals and reptiles and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, sir, for never have I eaten anything profane and unclean. The voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times and then the object was taken up into the sky. So those uh, first 16 verses of this chapter, I think that there's a lot for us to uh, be able to reflect on and to unpack with each other. You know, in verses 1 through 8, we hear about Cornelius. We meet this man named Cornelius, who we find out is a part of the Italian cohort, um, meaning that he was a, a government official for the Roman government. Mm -hmm. um, he was a centurion. So he was a, a soldier in the army. We also learn in verse 2 that he was a devout man and someone who feared God. So I think when you uh, stop and really think about those first two verses, to me they're really interesting. 
Because we, we need someone who is a Roman soldier, part of the Italian cohort, mm -hmm. and also someone who is a, a fearing God, meaning that he's in relationship with God. So he believes in God. But the implication there in those verses is that he's not really, he's not Jewish. Right. He's not a part of the Jewish uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And also he hasn't fully committed himself to living as a Jewish individual. So he would be a Gentile. So he would be a Gentile. Okay. But he's someone that definitely, as, as the scripture here tells us, believes in God, fears God, and lives in a way that uh, he's in relationship with God. But the thing that's what's fascinating um, is that, you know, as a centurion, as someone as a part of the Roman government, uh, he wouldn't have been really well liked by the Jewish community. Okay. Uh, and there would probably have even been people that hated him, like strongly disliked Cornelius for the way that he lived. And his life was in some ways almost like a paradox, right? That mm -hmm. he's a part of the Roman government, part of this system of oppression. Um, the system that continued to tax people and the system of, of violence at times. And at the same time, though, he was someone who was devout. He lived in relationship with God. He believed in God. He was God-fearing. Um, I mean, I think that's a really important foundation about who Cornelius is. And I think that's one of the things that we've talked a lot about in Bible study is that when we find out about someone in the Scripture and the Scripture gives us someone's name, there's something significant about that, and it's, it should be something that we just don't gloss over and jump to the part where we hear about Peter because we're familiar with him. Right. But I think there's something about Cornelius' own life as we go through this scripture that we're going to be able to see probably ourselves and part of his story. Absolutely. But as it goes on, we find out that he finds himself in prayer at, in some translations, uh, it says 3 o'clock, which I think is what yours it says, says three. In my translation, which is the New Revised Standard Version, it says three o'clock. But in other translations, it'll say in the ninth hour, uh, which is a reference to three o'clock. And actually, the Apostles isn't just recording that so we know like what time of the day it was, just to know what time yes. of the day it was. Mm -hmm. um, but really, that three o'clock time was, was a customary time when the Jewish community would find themselves in prayer. So there's significance to it being 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's not just a random sort of time. Mm -hmm. um, but that 3 o'clock, it just shows again how even though Cornelius was God-fearing, um, and even though he wasn't completely living the Jewish lifestyle, the implication again being that he hasn't been circumcised right. uh, and accepting fully this Jewish tradition and faith but he was still adhering but he was still certain, living to yeah to practices. certain parts of it mm -hmm. certain practices of the tradition of the jewish community right. and so it's while he's in prayer that he actually has this vision from god and so the vision that he receives from god is that is that god is speaking directly to cornelius um, god says in uh, verse three cornelius calls him by name Mm -hmm. um, and hearing his name, this, the, the verse 4 says that he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And God answers, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. I mean, I think that's such a beautiful and powerful interaction that he has with this angel of God who comes and speaks his name. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Cornelius recognizes that it's the Lord, Lord speaking, speaking to through him. this mm -hmm. angel. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like I think you go back to those first verses and knowing who Cornelius is and knowing how he's living his life as a centurion, as someone who's accepting and adopting certain practices uh, and certain lifestyle of the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. to, to know when he hears this voice calling his name, he recognizes it as the Lord. Absolutely. I think that this is such an important piece of what it means for us to be living as disciples of Jesus. What it means for us to be living as missionary disciples is that we have to be the ones who are constantly listening for this voice from God that's calling us. Mm -hmm. um, I think something we, we, we talk about often at St. Columbanus, and I know Dr. Nemo has spoken about it, is that when God calls, God doesn't do it in a generic sort of way. But the call 
that we receive from God mm -hmm. for whatever our vocation is, whatever it is that God's trying to do in our lives, it's always specific and it's always personal. Um, and, I, and I think that we can't lose sight of the fact that this call that God gives is, is, is personal. Right. Um, and I mean, that's why the angel here is, is calling Cornelius by name, speaking his name. So there's no confusion, right, about who the angel is speaking to. Um, you know, I, I've told the story before about my own vocation and my own uh, willingness to even think about becoming a priest. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, you know, that call story happened when I was a sophomore in college and I was on retreat in Taizé, France. Uh, and while I was there on retreat one evening uh, praying, uh, and we've done Taizé here at the parish, so mm -hmm. I think some of you might have some familiarity. Jennifer did that um, last semester or yes. before we were under mm -hmm. restrictions about being in church together and social distancing. Mm -hmm. But Taizé is just, a, it's, a, it's a way of praying through song and through meditation. And it's about being still um, and really opening yourself to that presence of God. But I remember for myself being in that chapel in Taizé, France and being in prayer and really feeling this voice, this presence from God inviting me to even think about priesthood Okay. And to think about making the decision to go to the college seminary. You know, so for me, priesthood had been something that I thought about probably all the way back to second grade. Uh, I remember in second grade making a, a Pope mobile, you know, that hangs from the ceiling wow. about someone that you looked up to and someone that you wanted to be someday. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the, the projects that I did in second grade. Thinking about it all throughout high school, um, but never really wanting to make that commitment. Okay until I was on retreat in France and with a group of other students from Loyola University Chicago and being in the chapel and just really feeling this this call in my life not knowing that would I become a priest or even knowing what all the steps were to become a priest right. but just knowing um, in the in my heart that like that was the moment for me to really start thinking about the priesthood so take the step and go to the college seminary. So would that be your encounter? So That's that would definitely be my moment time? of encounter. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've been preaching about over the last couple of weeks, these, Pope Francis has called for us to create cult a culture of encounter. Yeah, I mean, this opportunity to have this unexpected meeting, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. how I defined uh, encounter this past Sunday in my sermon. But I think, you know, my story, and I'm sure your story of, of moments of, of encountering Jesus and knowing that God was calling to something. I mean, that's what's really happening here for Cornelius. Mm -hmm. um, in my story, you know, God wasn't calling me to just do something arbitrary. Okay. But the call was very clear in my heart um, that I needed to go to the seminary. So it involved uh, ending a relationship with someone that I was in and telling my family and my friends that I think I wanted to be a priest at okay. a time when not a lot of people were excited about the idea of me so, wanting to be a priest. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, for me, just feeling that that call was particular, it mm -hmm. was personal, and it was calling me to something unique. You know, that's similar to what Cornelius is experiencing. Mm -hmm. He finds himself in prayer. He hears the angel of the Lord speak his name, and then he is given something to do. And that's what those next verses are about. He's supposed to go and find this man... Simon, who's called Peter, Peter. Mm -hmm. who's lodging with Simon, a tanner, um, and, and to really to call him everything, to call and tell him everything um, that he had just experienced. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the mission, the mission mm -hmm. that Cornelius is given by the angel to really go out and search for Simon Peter. And then when we get to verse nine, or in verses 7 and 8, what we learn is that uh, Cornelius obeys, right? Right. So the angel had spoken and he left. He called two of his slaves and a devout soldier and they, who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Mm -hmm. so, so Cornelius not only hears the call, but he makes he the decisions mm -hmm. to obey. Yeah, he responds to the call. And I think, you know, in my own life, and I don't know if you want to share your own encounter story but i think that that moment of obeying is probably what's most difficult 
Um, yes, absolutely. My encounter, my encounter was kind of sort of matter of factly. I was uh, on my way home from work, beginning of a vacation for me, and I got off work at 6.30 and I'm on the Dan Ryan, and just as I'm making it here for my turn off, 71st Street, you know, as clear as day, I heard a voice say, you know, you should go to church. It was a Sunday morning, and I, I've told this part before, I've passed St. Calabanus maybe four, five years straight, twice a day, on my way to the expressway and, you know, getting off the expressway to come home. But this particular morning, I, for whatever reason, I, I just had, I had the inclination, I had the voice telling me to, to come to service, come to Mass, because actually I wasn't Catholic at the time. So I parked the car, I got a park in front, and I walked in, and, and sure enough, I, I had my encounter. I mean, that for me, the voice was kind of, you know, when you're getting off of work at 6.30 after doing an overnight shift, you know, you're not mindless driving, but you're really not, you know. Just trying to get home. Just trying to get home. But this was clear enough for me, and it was such that it, you know, compelled me to stop. And of course, St. Calabanus is the, the church that I would pass through to get home. And as I said, and I walked in the door, I just, I felt that this was where I was supposed to be. This is where I was supposed to be. And I had my radical hospitality in one person, and she knows who she is. She's my mentor. She invited me. I mean, just clear out the blue. I and mean, she probably saw that I was a unfamiliar person, maybe a, a new person's mm -hmm. coming in. But she invited me to come over and, and sit with her, you know, through the service, which for me would have been, you know, really monumental because I'm not shy, but I'm rather reserved. So if I'm coming in someplace, I'm going to sit in the back, which I did for out a couple of months. Out of sight. Out of sight. Because just, just kind of sort of keep to myself and observe. But for me, even getting off the expressway, parking my car, coming in, all of it was very uh, active, very proactive, very engaged. Even from sitting down and kind of sort of going through the ritual because I went to Catholic school so I knew a lot of the practices of how the Mass goes along. But, you know, from the calling from the car all the way into through the service, I felt like this was the beginning of a mission. So, and here you are. And here I am. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's this place you know, last year in our revival, we talked about what it means to trust and believe. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Cornelius really models that for us, right? He has to trust that this voice that he's hearing speak and call his name isn't just some random voice. He has to trust that it's the voice of the Lord speaking through this angel. And then he has to believe in what it is that the voice is calling him to, to do. do. Right. And, and, and I mean, look at what the initial call for Cornelius to do is to find Simon, who they call Peter. It wasn't just to uh, you know change everything about his life, to abandon everything, like when Jesus invited those first disciples mm -hmm. to to leave behind their whole life. Right. No, the mission that God gave to Cornelius in this moment was to find Simon, who they call Peter. So one specific. A specific mission, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, sometimes that's where I, I wonder in our own life of discipleship, as we keep talking about becoming missionary disciples and thinking about how God is calling us to use our lives uh, in service of him to, to allow God's will to be fulfilled through us. I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that what God is going to call us to is something like huge and grand and great. And right. it's to move mountains. But really, God is constantly calling us in our daily lives. Right. Every day. God's calling us in those ordinary places. And I think where we have to wrestle as people of faith is, are we sitting in a place where we can actually receive that message? Right. Are we living in such a way that we can actually hear God's voice speaking something into us? Mm -hmm. And are we filled with enough faith to actually trust and believe and have a willingness to obey what it is that God is calling Call us, us to. to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, that, that's everything about who Cornelius is in this moment. And even as he, you know, he hears the voice, he's filled with fear. Yes. He's filled with uncertainty about who it is that's calling him and why it is that God would be speaking to him in this moment. But nonetheless, he was willing to obey. Right. And, I, and I think 
as we go through the rest of this chapter, understanding Cornelius and how he was living his life up until this moment is really important. Um, and that's why I just, you know, we shared our own stories of encounter, our own call stories, um, because all of us have one. All of us can think back to that particular moment. Maybe it's more recently. Uh, maybe it's more dramatic, like mm-hmm. mine, of being in Taizé, France, in a chapel, in prayer, and Already feeling journey, yeah. Yeah, that this was going to happen. Or maybe it's that ordinary, you were driving past somewhere. Right. And feeling that, that voice, that presence, that peace you know, within yourself that was calling you to something. Um, I mean, I think it's not always going to be like a voice like you hear right now as we're speaking. Right. Um, but it is, it's that peace that you feel within you that... That, that sense of knowing what you're supposed to do. Right. And for us as people of faith and for us who are trying to keep growing and maturing in our life as disciples, mm-hmm. um, we always have to have that willingness to obey. Right. Because then we move into, you know, starting in verse 9, we hear about Peter, and his vision. who we know as an apostle, mm-hmm. as, you know, the first pope, right? The, the rock, the foundation that uh, Jesus is willing to... Build the, Sadie, Sadie agrees about this, I guess. Um, but, you know, that he's really willing to, to build his church upon. But Peter's vision doesn't go quite like Cornelius. Uh, there's something different that happens. Because as, as God is giving this vision to Peter, he says no. So there's obviously a difference. Mm-hmm. in Cornelius mm-hmm. and Peter, right? Except so exactly. so Peter has this vision that he's supposed to, to eat something that, and he says, no, I've never eaten or taken anything that's profane or unclean. So in those verses, verses 9 to 16, right? Mm-hmm. What, we, what we learn about Peter is that he has a vision and he's not willing to obey. And to me, it's always interesting in the scriptures when things and people and situations and circumstances and events are put in contrast with one another. Exactly. Because he's Jewish, so he's following the rules, the ritual, which is, you know, the edict from the vision is telling him to do something counterintuitive, something other than. So his first response would be, no, I'm not going to break the rules. Yeah, so he's concerned about breaking the rules, right? Because he's living a devout Jewish life. Mm -hmm. But here's Cornelius, who's a God-fearing man, as the scripture tells us, who's able to recognize the voice of God speaking in his life, just like Peter is. Mm -hmm. They both understand who it is that is speaking to them in their vision, in their moment of encounter. Cornelius is willing to say, yeah, and sends the men to find Simon, who they call Peter, Mm -hmm. whereas Peter doesn't want to to break the rules. And I know we've talked about this in our in our Bible studies uh, over the last months is that, you know, Jesus comes not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. That's why we've talked too about how Jesus, when he's been asked, what's the greatest of the commandments? He doesn't think up something new. He doesn't, uh, you know, create a a brand new uh, rule or commandment that people have to follow. He just says, no, you should love the Lord your God with everything you have, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And it's the one thing that encompasses all of the other. Yeah, all of the laws, all of the rules, all of the commandments. I, what Jesus is trying to teach is that there, in that, those two, really one, yeah. love, love. Um, everything else is encompassed in that. Mm-hmm. What I think is fascinating about Peter's response is the fact that he doesn't quite see it. So he's so focused on, right, like, I got to live by the law. I got to do exactly what my tradition and my heritage and my religious upbringing is teaching me that he misses out on the fact that it's the voice of God Mm -hmm. that's calling him to this. It's not one of the other disciples who are trying to put him in a position to to make him unclean. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a non-believer, right, who's trying to mess with his life. Right. But this vision he has is is from God, and he's willing, initially, right, he's willing to say no. So now I think about our stories again, and our own life, and your story, and your own moments of encounter, 
And I just think about it, like how many times have we said no? Or or doubted we didn't have faith. Yeah, or doubted the call, the voice, mm-hmm. the, vision the vision that God was trying to give in our life. Not because we thought it wasn't God, but just because it felt so contrary to what we know. Or what we've been doing all this time. And I think that's a place, again, in our in our spiritual journey that requires faith and trust. It's why we're here in Bible study, because we need to keep learning and we need to keep rooting ourselves in the Word of God. Mark um, would say that we're our cup or our body or we're full, but every now and then we leak. And so we have to continually to be... He, that Dr. Nemo is just filled with great wisdom. Even when he's not here, <laughs> he's it's not like here. he's here. He's here. <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I do think, you know, when we think about those moments when we've said no, you know, sometimes what I've learned as a priest is that sometimes people, we're really hard on ourselves in our spiritual journey and in our relationship with God. Um, you know, we, we convince ourselves, I think, that we have to be perfect, right? that we have to get it all together, and when we don't, then there must be something wrong with us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's why we look at people like Peter and we realize that Peter's already been given the mission to be the rock and to be the foundation. Right. He's already been entrusted uh, with his leadership position in the early Christian community. He's already the one that others want to have encounters with because they know how close Peter was to Jesus. Jesus. But even in Peter's own life, even being that close to Jesus, there's still these moments when he falls short. Um, So I think, you know, it's not about beating up on Peter as much as it is giving us permission Mm -hmm. in those moments when when we have made mistakes or we have said no or we haven't quite accepted the vision that God has for our lives. That, that doesn't mean that's the end of our relationship with God, that God is still calling us. Because mm-hmm. I think that's where I'm going to invite you to read, you know, 17 down to 33. Mm-hmm. Because even with this initial no, there's still something that Peter's willing to do. And what we're going to see in these next verses is that Peter has like an aha moment, right? Like okay. he sort of realizes what he was supposed to be doing. Gotcha. While Peter was in doubt about the meaning of the vision he had seen, the men sent by Cornelius asked for Simon's house and arrived at the entrance. They called out inquiring whether Simon, who is called Peter, was staying there. As Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, there are three men here looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without hesitation because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your being here? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, respected by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in and showed them hospitality. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met them, and falling at his feet paid him homage. Peter, however, raised him up, saying, Get up, I myself am also a human being. While he conversed with him, he went in and found many people gathered together and said to them, you know that it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call any person profane or unclean. And that is why I came without objection when sent for. May I ask then why you summoned me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago, at this hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, I was at prayer in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling robes stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your almsgivings remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter. 
He is a guest in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you were kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to listen to all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So I think what we see, or what we hear uh, in the second part of this sort of story of Peter and Cornelius is that, you know, something changes about Peter. So in that first vision, right, this, this food appears that Peter is unwilling to eat. And after the third time of being told to eat this, he doesn't, and then it disappears. And then the next day, suddenly there, he feels the spirit again. There's this other vision that happens, that there's some individuals that are coming uh, to, to talk to him. And so immediately, without hesitation this time, he goes down to greet them, mm -hmm. to tell them who he is. Um, they tell them, they tell Peter why he's there, why they're there, mm -hmm. that they've been sent to, to get him. And then he goes back and he meets Cornelius. And then Cornelius tells the story of how it is that Peter winds up there. Um, and I think, again, like as we're watching, as we're listening to this story progressing, you know, again, it's Cornelius has a vision, hears his name and is willing to obey. Right. Peter has a vision, uh, not willing to obey the first time. And then Peter has another vision where, you know, he's supposed to do this. And, and the second time he does without hesitation. And I think what we see in Peter's own life is how he's grown even though it's just one from one day to the next, mm -hmm. right? There's something about that first vision and the second vision and a growth that's taken place in between there. Because the second time he recognizes that he enters the house of Cornelius and he even makes the point of saying like, it's unlawful right. for a Jewish man to enter the house of someone who's a Gentile, who isn't, who isn't Jewish. Mm -hmm. But I've come to realize that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, that's what Peter is saying to Cornelius. So it's like Peter's acknowledging the fact that this doesn't feel right because of how he was brought up and right. because of his religious tradition and heritage. And for Cornelius to be such a devout man, a God-fearing man, someone who knew the Jewish customs and laws and traditions and lifestyle, he too understood what he was asking Peter to do in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so both of them have this ability to acknowledge what's really happening in, in the moment, what's happening in that situation, but still they're both in their own way, right? Trying to be faithful right. to yeah. this call to be living out this vision that they receive from God. And I think that's what's so powerful and so significant um, is that both of them in their own way are trying to respond to this vision, to this call, mm -hmm. trying to do what it is that the Lord is asking them to do. Um, and what, what Cornelius is able to understand too is that as we get to the end, like in verses you know, 33 there, that the reason why Peter is to come into the house is because he has a message to deliver. Right. And so Cornelius, I would imagine, based on what the scripture is saying here, is rather excited for the fact that he, he knows that this Peter that he has sent for has a message from the Lord to deliver. That's why he's assembled. The relatives you know, and friends. Yeah, he got, the, he got all the neighbors together. He got everybody he knows together so that together they could hear this message that the Lord wanted to speak. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I just think about Cornelius and Peter and how in a real way, as both of them are trying to live in relationship with God, they're actually witnessing to one another, right? Okay. Cornelius is witnessing what it means to have this complete trust and faith and a willingness to obey. Okay. And Peter is gonna witness to Cornelius and the crowds, which we're gonna read in just a second, mm -hmm. this through the sermon that he's about to deliver, this message that the Lord wants the community to receive. So Cornelius is, is telling, in telling the story of how it is, how it is that Peter even showed up at his house. You know, he's retelling the story of his own vision and his own call. He's acknowledging, like, look, I, I understand that this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I know that you're a this Jewish is not man. Normal. <laughs> yeah, he, he acknowledges that. He knows that. 
But he's also saying to Peter, like, look, but, but I also trust that this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I, I know that this vision I had is real, and I'm trying to obey. I'm trying to obey. Absolutely. So again, like, I, you know, in our Bible study, in our time of reflection with one another, it's always about how do we see ourselves fitting into this story? And what is this cast of characters, you know, what does it have to say to us in our own spiritual life, in our own walk with Jesus? Because we can identify, I can identify with Cornelius because prior to, I was a different religion, non-practicing, but I was different. But I knew the Lord just from foundation, and I knew when I heard my call, I knew that, you know, I was going to come, I was going to be here, I needed this. And then in Peter, we have those people that are devout, mm -hmm. that are following, but were asked to do something outside of the norm and still be human enough to doubt and say, no, no, not, not right away. But, you know, upon, you know, reflection, well, maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, one of the, the pitfalls or one of the challenges that we have to constantly be aware of in our own walk, in our, in our life as missionary disciples is that, you know, just like, just like I said, in, in what, is, what is an encounter? It's an unexpected meeting. I mean, God is a God of surprise. And God is the one who constantly does the unexpected. And I think in the moments when we think that we have God figured out, mm -hmm. or when we think that we have our plans figured out, or we think that we have our life figured out, or everything is just sort of going the way we want, I think that's a real place to stop and really wrestle with are you really doing what God wants you to be doing? Are you, Are you really doing? living in the way that God wants you to be living? Because when we become so comfortable complacent. and so complacent with our relationship with God or, or how we even think about how God acts in our life or in the life of the world, then we probably have lost sight of who God is and what it is that God is actually calling us to. to mm -hmm. and, I, and I would imagine for some of you uh, who have been on this journey a little bit longer than I have, I mean, I think it's one of those places where, you know, why are you still on the journey? Because if God stops surprising you, or if, if you figure out who God is when you're 20 and you don't discover anything new about who God is as you, as you continue to grow, right. I, I, are Why? You, are you continuing to grow? Are you yeah. just going through the motions? Or has it become just... And I think that's why, you know, we live in a community of faith. You know, for us as Catholics and as Christians, that's why we live as a community. That's why we are called to be church. Is because we recognize that, like, we can't do this on our own. That we need to have the Corneliuses and the Peters in our life um, to be witnessing to one another about how we live this out. Like, you can, you can be devout and you can be God-fearing and you can be a person of prayer, even if everybody around you doesn't think that you really belong, right? Because that's how people would have felt about Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Like, that's cool that he's a dude of prayer, but, but. You know, he's not one of us. <laughs> and then at the same time, those people, or those moments when maybe we're that person, who's like Peter, who, who clearly says no to God the first time, even though we'll say like, I know God. Mm -hmm. I know God's voice. I'm someone that, you know, practices my faith. I'm a, I'm a church-going person. But then we still say no to God's plans. Cornelius, when I say that he witnesses to Peter, he's, he's recounting this vision. It wasn't just Cornelius woke up one day and was like, oh, I want Simon, who they call Peter, to come by the house and hang out for a little bit. That would be really good if I can get one of the disciples to come to my house. Yeah, he's not sending his people on a whole day's journey to just go find some dude just for the opportunity to find him. No, he wants him there because he understands that God needed him there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for us in our own life as disciples where we have to keep humbling ourselves. To understand that this, this message, this good news of Jesus, isn't just meant for us who are church-going folk. Isn't meant for us who come to Bible study virtually on Tuesday mornings. It isn't just for us who volunteer in the parish. No, like this, this invitation from Jesus to live as a disciple is for everyone. everyone. So that's what I think will bring us now into verses 34 to 43. Um, and here what we... My heading uh, in my Bible says, the Gentiles hear the good news. I have Peter's speech. 
Yeah, so what we're about to hear is that Peter, now that he's in the house, now that he and Cornelius have both had the opportunity to, to share about their visions mm -hmm. and what brought them to this moment, as Cornelius says that he's ready to listen to all that the Lord has commanded him to say, Peter's about to give his sermon, his speech. Wonderful. Then Peter proceeded to speak and said, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. What has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on a third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. So I hope by now you've learned this one fancy word that we keep talking about in Bible study every week. It starts with a K. Kerygma. <laughs> yeah. Um, because that's what, that's what Peter's sermon is about. So I, I think what's beautiful and powerful about what Peter is preaching here, because it's not just a speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's not, yeah, he's trying to persuade people to believe something, which is often what we do in a speech. speech. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's meant to help inform people. It's meant to persuade people. But as a sermon, you know, that's where Peter is using the kerygma. He's teaching this, this fundamental core foundational belief and teaching about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And so again, he, he recounts the story of Jesus, how he suffered, how he died, how God raised him on the third day, how he's the one that the apostles bear witness to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I always like that in the scriptures, especially when the apostles are speaking, Peter does it, Paul does it in his writings. Like, they're not talking about hearsay. Right? Peter's not showing up in a Cornelius' house to deliver this sermon, talking about something that someone else had told him about Jesus. No, right. he's speaking with the authority to say, I've witnessed this. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. dined with him. I've sat with him. I broke bread with him. I know this. He's commanded, or in your translation, he's commissioned us to preach this to people and testify that he is the one ordained by God as the judge of the living and the dead. And then again, Back to the Jewish roots in verse 43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think what we learn again in, in Peter's sermon hopefully isn't new to us at this point in studying Acts of the Apostles and isn't new to us in our own life as missionary disciples. Right. But instead, this, uh, this charisma, this teaching... It's really meant to encourage Cornelius mm -hmm. and his relatives and friends, all the people that are there in the house who are learning in this moment who Jesus is, inviting them to make a decision for themselves, right, right. to accept Jesus, mm -hmm. to follow Jesus, to, to devote their life to really giving everything over. Go back again to the beginning of chapter 10. Cornelius was a devout and God-fearing man. Absolutely. But he wasn't Jewish. So there was a certain place or a certain moment where Cornelius wasn't willing to fully commit to the Jewish life, okay. right? Because he didn't get circumcised. No, he didn't. So that would have been the thing, right, that he needed to do in order to really be fully initiated or mm -hmm. living in this covenant relationship with God. Right. But now... 
Cornelius is obviously in a different place. Mm -hmm. um, and he hears this, this kerygma, this teaching, this sermon from Peter. Um, and, and Peter, again, he's, he's reminding those crowds that we are the witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. That's why in our church, in the Catholic Church, we, we talk about how we're one holy Catholic and apostolic. apostolic. <laughs> because we trace our roots back to those first apostles, those first missionary disciples. Mm -hmm. um, and we've reflected on that. We've reflected on how the bishops are sort of that image, mm -hmm. that li living image of apostolic succession. Um, how it's this apostolic tradition that brings about a sense of unity in the life of the church, um, the apostolic tradition that's been passed on from generation to generation. Peter's doing all of that in this moment. Mm -hmm. He's there preaching a message to invite people into this fullness of life with God mm -hmm. and doing it as they're trying to build up the church right. and using their own story, their own ability to witness to everything that Jesus did. That's where we're invited. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one thing that, you know, when I was reading this and praying over this scripture, that I, it jumped out to me was when they put him to death by hanging him on a tree in verse 39. You know, I know we, 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 we've talked about um, Jesus' death and his resurrection, but in, in, in black theology, there's a, a great theologian named James Cone. Uh, who passed away just a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the works that James Cone wrote was The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this book, which is one of my uh, favorite theological books that I've ever read, and James Cone is one of my favorite theologians, mm -hmm. um, but he writes about how, how the cross and the lynching tree have become, how they're so similar because both of them were instruments of torture right. and instruments of humiliation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to be thinking about in our life as disciples of Jesus. So in this kerygma, in this foundational, fundamental teaching, Peter and the other apostles never shy away from reminding people that Jesus died on the cross, right. that they hung him on a tree. Like, that's essential to the story. Mm -hmm. It's essential to understanding the resurrection. You know, as we find ourselves in this moment as a country and as a world in need of racial tension, I think that the reflection that James Cone offers in his own work, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, is that we can't come to a place of healing in our country or as people until we acknowledge the fact that black people in the United States have been and in some places continue continue, continue to be lynched mm -hmm. and how both of those moments the cross and the lynching tree yeah they're they're places of torture they're places of pain they're places of trauma mm -hmm. they can be places of hopelessness um, but they're also the place where the community would gather so there were people at the foot of the cross, at right. the foot of that tree, mm -hmm. as Jesus was being crucified. Mm -hmm. And as people were hung from trees, as people were lynched, there was a community that would have to come and take that body down from the tree. And somehow, both the cross and the lynching tree, and the experiences that the community have, even in the midst of unimaginable pain, right. still found hope and still came to a place of faith mm -hmm. and came to a place of perseverance. So I think about that as I minister in the African-American community. And, and, I, and I think about, I wrote a, a thesis paper once um, about how you know, gun violence in the city mm -hmm. is the new lynching tree, is the new cross that many people have to carry. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, you know, I think about our own neighborhood here in Park Manor and I think about what happens just on Sunday while we were at mass, a young man just a block and a half away from the church was mm -hmm. shot while we were at mass. So what Peter is preaching 2000 years ago, mm -hmm. we still need to be preaching today. Right. We still need to be reminding people, telling the story of how Jesus was hung on the tree, how he was put to death. But... God raised him on the third day. Right. 
And when we think about those lynching trees, those places of violence and trauma and harm and, and pain and suffering and, and, and everything that is evil in our world, mm -hmm. we're still called to be the ones like Peter who share this good news that, that God can still be at work, right. that life can still be possible. Um, because that's really what Peter is preaching here. Right. He's preaching this message of hope, but he's not afraid to talk about what was hard. He's not afraid to talk about what was painful. What is the, the catalyst for our conversion or for the change in civil rights? Absolutely. Yeah, and That's I think, true. you know, mm -hmm. even as we uh, celebrate the life of Representative Lewis this mm -hmm. week, you know, you, you as he went across that bridge again, mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about those people who have struggled and who have died and who, who have given their life, who were physically harmed throughout you know, the civil rights movement and, and, and lots of other movements and revolutions throughout history mm -hmm. that have brought about real change. And I think that's where for us as people of faith, we don't live our faith in a vacuum. No. The Bible is not meant to just be some book that talks about stuff that happened a long time ago. Right. But it's meant to be the inspiration that we have. So um, just knowing that we are coming to our last minutes, let's just read um, the last few verses, verses 44 to 48. The baptism of Cornelius. While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit, even as we have. He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for a few days. So I think that's the place of hope, mm -hmm. right? So after preaching this message, after going through these visions, after this journey of, of saying no and then saying yes, and Cornelius having trust and faith and willingness to obey, the result of all of that is the gift and the reception of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Uh, and even, you know, those believers who were there with Peter, mm -hmm. they still didn't quite understand what God was trying to do in the moment um, and how it was that these people who were Gentiles, Gentiles. Mm -hmm. could receive the gift of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And Peter reminds them that they're receiving the gift just as we have. Right. I think for me, and, and then the way it ends, then they invited him to stay for several days. <laughs> That's radical hospitality. Yes, absolutely. That's what we've been trying to talk about or what we're starting to talk about more as a parish. Mm -hmm. This gift of the Spirit, this invitation to a life in Christ mm -hmm. isn't just meant for those who go to church or who study the Bible or who have it all together. The invitation is for anyone. Mm -hmm. Anyone who hears the good news of Jesus and makes the decision, makes the choice, to follow him, to become a disciple, to give their life over. Friends, that's where I think we each have to do the work and to recognize that God calls all of us, all of us by name for a particular mission. But the mission that all of us always have to share in together as part of this body, as part of the church, is yes. to invite others to come to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when we know the kerygma, right, when we know the story of Jesus, when we can talk about the story, when we recognize that God calls us by name mm -hmm. to be witnesses to Jesus, then we have the potential and the power and the opportunity and the sacred responsibility to bring this gift of the Holy Spirit into the world. Never out of our own power, but always God working through us. Right. I think that's why you know what Mark would say and what we've been saying today is that we have to know our story. We have to know where we started, we have to keep going back to that moment. Uh, Pope Francis calls it those Galilee moments. We have to keep going back to those moments when we first encountered Jesus, when we first heard God calling us to a life of discipleship, and then to pay attention to the visions and the voices and the opportunities that we have each and every day mm -hmm. to recognize that God's calling us to something new, right? right? Today's a new day, and this is a new moment. And so this is the opportunity for God to call you and to call each of us to something great. So thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you for, to Kimberly for being with us. Hopefully um, you've enjoyed our Bible study today, even without 
Dr. Nemo here. Um, but before we go, let's just say a, a prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we, we thank you again for the gift of this day. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, and we thank you for calling us by name. We thank you for the, the great things that you ask each of us to do with our lives. And so we ask you, Lord, to help each of us grow in relationship with you, to help us fall more and more in love with you, to fill us with your spirit so that we might always be unafraid to share the good news of your son in our world. We ask you, Lord, to help us grow as your witnesses who always share this great news that you are the God of resurrection and life. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that you come to us today, for the ways that you're present with us in this moment, and for all that you are calling us to do. We just ask you, Lord, to fill us with your spirit so that we might be filled with faith and trust and hope and the courage to always say yes to you. We thank you, God, for all that you've done and all that you promised to do as we pray together through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. So we look forward to uh, you joining us next Tuesday for our Bible study at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be jumping into chapter 11 of Acts of the Apostles. And Dr. Nemo will be back with us next week. Yes, so have a great day.